This is the future. Hello, I'm Edwin Rydberg, and you're listening to the Alternate Futures Podcast, where we chat with indie science fiction creators about their work, the world, and anything else in between. Today, I'm here with Ned Marcus. Ned was born in Northwest England, but has lived in different parts of Europe and Asia for the past 30 years, and is now based in Northern Taiwan. He writes fantasy and science fiction, and his first series, Blue Prometheus, begins in the London riots of 2011, although it quickly moves to an exotic planet of magic. Ned's second series, Orange Storm, begins when intelligent but hostile life comes to Earth. Hi, Ned. Thanks for joining me from halfway around the world. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I understand that's getting towards the end of the day there, although it's morning here. But yes, uh, yeah. So how long have you been living then in, in Taiwan? Well, on and off for about um, maybe 27, 28 years, they're, they're pushing 30 years, quite a long time. Wow, okay. So, so you said you traveled around Europe and Asia quite a lot before that. Did yeah, I was working you? in in Spain for a while, Portugal. Um, my father lived in France, so I spent a lot of time in France and I worked in France a little bit. Um, Turkey, Turkey too and um, traveling in, in, well, many places. So I think Taiwan is the, longest, is the longest stretch. Not all that 30 years was living in Taiwan, but a lot of it was. I've visited a few of those places you mentioned, but uh, this is my fourth country. Can, can kind of appreciate what you've experienced, but it uh, sounds like you're far more uh, advanced than I ever was. I, I'm quite interested in the Taiwan thing to start with, if you don't mind. Um, sure. And just... So what's it like living there compared to, say, Europe? Um, it's, well, it's hot. <laughs> For one thing, it's hot. <laughs> um, it's, it's quite noisy, although I, I live in the countryside now. So um, people are, are, are friendly. I, mean, I know people always say that at every country, but actually they are, they are friendly. They're friendly. They're helpful. They will help you. And um, um, it's when I first arrived in Taiwan, I just felt almost immediately that yeah, this is a good country to live in because the reaction from the people, people helping me, people very nice. And it's kind of, it's has some, it's orderly, but not too, not too orderly, not like Singapore or Japan. I mean, I, I love both of those places, but it's got some chaos and, but it's still an easy country to live in. And um, food's good. It's very convenient. I mean, convenience is a very popular word in, in Chinese and, um, so everything is really convenient. Uh, if you're in Taipei or any big city, you can eat like tw almost pretty much 24 hours a day. And mm. the cost of living is quite low. So it's, it's, it's good. Yeah, Yeah, sounds nice. Uh, it's always good to, to live in a place where the, the people are very friendly. And like you say, it, it sounds quite organic as opposed to what you might picture um, Japan to be. I think so, yeah. It's a different feeling to Japan. Yeah. And so um, while you, you mentioned also previously that, that you've learned Chinese as well, among other yeah. languages that you've forgotten. How, how challenging was that? Um, quite challenging. I mean, I'm still, me, I can speak Chinese, I can hold a conversation, but I'm not perfect in Chinese. And by my reading, I can read to some extent, but that's a challenge. The, the, learning the characters is hard and um, I still have room for improvement in, in, in that, really. And is that, uh, is that Cantonese but, or...? No, Mandarin. Mandarin. I mean, in, okay. Ta in Taiwan, there are actually about 15 or 17 languages, but most of them are quite minority. So there are just three big languages. And um, Taiwanese, of course, is spoken by everyone, really. But Mandarin Chinese is one I chose to learn. So. Hmm. And, I mean, these days you've got to ask, do you feel any of the political issues where you're living? Because, of course with the Chinese influence moving into the West more, then we are paying more attention to what they're doing. And we see that Taiwan is kind of one of those territories that's in, in the middle in terms of, you know, how it's treated by the world, different parts of the world, uh, with, a, with, a, with a claim by China, I think. Yeah. Do you feel the encroachment of China at all, or, or is it just life as normal? Well, no, I think people always feel the pressure. There's a pressure from China. I mean, when I first came to Taiwan, um, there, were, there was no democratically elected government, which Chinese preferred, of course. And I was in Taiwan in the first um, democratic elections, and the Chinese flew missiles over the north of the island, just it was over the sea, but well within the territory. And um, 
Amer luckily, America, the U.S. sent their seventh fleet steaming up the, the Taiwan Straits, and the Chinese fleet they they disappeared. So I mean, they were threatening, and they've been threatening constantly. And so they, there's always a feeling that you know it, of pressure from China. They always threaten. Um, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. At the moment, it's a little bit more. So people feel it, but but you know, I, I don't think most people are too worried about it. Really, it's not. People don't live in fear. I, I don't live in fear. I mean, we just we live, and that's it. It's one of those weird things, isn't it? How you can adapt. Um, I lived in Israel for a few years, actually during the one of the Gulf Wars, and uh, life. I mean, there was a small change with you know guards near the entrance to buildings and stuff, but but otherwise, you know, and it's such a small country, and within you know sixty miles of where we were, or much less actually, there was you know conflict going on. And you, you don't notice it at all, really. It's quite strange, isn't it, how <laughs> you can become compartmentalized yes. like that? I mean, of course, some, some things uh, do affect us. For example, Taiwan handled COVID quite well, but it has come to Taiwan. And Taiwan had an order of, ma of um, vaccines from Germany, quite a large order. China stepped in and threatened Germany and with economic sanctions. So Germany quickly, they backed out of, of this uh, deal with Taiwan so th they're making life difficult in that way and we're still we're slowly getting vaccines coming in but you know things like that happen yeah COVID has been one of those events that has sort of exposed uh, a lot of the well workings of and flaws of um, the world structure I think hasn't it yes uh, specifically in this yeah. regards yeah uh, and speaking of that, so you teach at a local university and then you also run a, a science fiction fantasy writing group. How, how have they been affected by the COVID and have you still managed to keep them going? Or Well, for most of the time, you see, Taiwan has been quite good with COVID. Really, we immediately blocked all entries from China. They just didn't care. They didn't care about any, you know, you said, okay, Chinese people are not coming in for China, um, apart from you know, residents of Taiwan. And so it kind of it made it easier. So for a long time, we had it quite easy. But then suddenly about four or five weeks ago, we had restrictions and um, all teaching suddenly switched to online teaching. So I've been teaching online, uh, which we're in some application now. But uh, so, so that was the, the main effect. I had to teach online, um, which is not quite the same. I, mean, I prefer, it was okay. I got used to it, but um, it's not quite the same really as, as being in the classroom and the same with the critique group i mean that's really active and a really lively group um, we used to meet in like a um, cafe bar in central taipei uh, but that's they, they, they've closed they're still open for takeaways but you can't do that anymore so again we're online at the moment and so we're hoping that in july later in july we'll the restrictions will be lifted mm. And how is the internet access in Taiwan then? Is, is it pretty solid? Usually pretty good. Yeah, usually pretty good. I mean, I live in the countryside, so it's not as good. If it's a typhoon, I might have a problem. But, but otherwise, it's, it's very good. It's very modern. Taiwan has got very modern infrastructure, really. And um, yeah, it feels very modern. Actually, in some ways, it feels more modern than the UK in certain things. What, what kind of things would that be, do you think? Well, for example... If you go in the underground in London, it's really ancient and rattling and, and old. And here it's there's a new underground or MRT they call it, MRT system, very, very new. Um, there's just an efficiency here as well that makes it feel smooth. Life is smooth. You go into a shop and say, I, I, I wear I'm not wearing glasses now, but I do wear glasses. And if I want them in, in the UK, it can take me a couple of weeks, depending on where you are. It can take you a few days, a few weeks in Taiwan and say, oh. Can you come back in two hours or one hour or something like that? So there's a speed and efficiency and a helpfulness that there isn't uh, in the UK, maybe. But actually on the technology side, yeah, it just feels new. It just feels new. The, the internet is actually is, is good. Um, good infrastructure, yeah. Transportation, these, these kind of things. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, last time I got my glasses recently, it was still about a week. So yeah, I <laughs> can appreciate that. Uh, um, so how has living in Taiwan influenced your books then? Now we will finally get around to your writing. <laughs> um, um, yeah, because Blue I, I think Prometheus, it, I think sorry, Blue Prometheus has, uh, you said was inspired or not inspired, but written in the, starting in the London riots. Is that when you started writing it as well? And then did you sort of. Mm, a little bit before then, 
but I was not quite happy with the beginning. And so when the London riots started, because, yeah, when the London riots started, I just thought, okay, this is perfect for, for it's not perfect for London, but it was good, it's a good place to start. Um, because at the beginning of the story, there's, it's, it's fantasy, science fantasy, and there's a, like a, an evil entity outside of our universe who, whose thoughts, thoughts of evil kind of um, ripple through the universe, through the multiverse and causing bad things. And this was one of the bad things that it influenced in, in my story world. So, um, so it's a good place to start. So, um, yeah, but then I moved quickly to Taiwan and um, Taiwan has influenced my writing. Um, but I think living abroad has influenced my writing a lot as well, just as much. Sometimes I meet people in Taiwan and they hear that I'm writing and then they say, oh, you must be writing about Taiwan. Well, it's not really true. <laughs> not really true. I'm writing about different planets. But um, I've been influenced perhaps well, because I live here in, in surrounded by nature. Outside my house is a river and um, hills with like forest, tropical forest or subtropical forest. And a lot of stuff comes out of that. So I see a lot of insects and snakes and weird kind of things flying around. And the forests themselves, the trees, the plants, the flowers, a lot of that went into Blue Prometheus, which is set on a forest planet. So, mm, yeah. so that, and, and other things too. I mean, where I live is a small, a very small town and there's a really old market and it's almost covered. It's a covered market. And so I imagine this covered market when I was writing my second novel, which is set underground in, um, beneath the surface of Prometheus. Uh, because it just feel you feel like you're going underground in some of these places so um, so it has influenced me um probably it's influenced me in ways that I, i'm not i don't i'm not aware of as well but, uh, i've started reading it i'm part way through and I definitely i can say it doesn't feel like england so i imagine that uh taiwan yeah. probably had a fair amount of inspiration i was quite interested in the point of because it, it sort of mir mirrors uh, a little bit of the idea in my Dreams of Mortality series, the notion of an entity who, sort of the will and the word, the, uh, the entity kind of forms the universe out of its, out of a thought, and then that thought is becoming corrupted by another entity. And I'm quite, I'm quite interested in that idea. Does it inform a lot of the book or is it more of a sort of down to earth, character driven uh, story series? Parts of it. It informs parts of the magic and parts of the, the, the background to the world. Um, the idea that, I mean, it's been around for a while now, world, but the idea that you can think something and your thoughts affect things around you. Of course, with magic, I, I make um, entities do this and, um, and it's part of the magic. So thinking and then the thought becomes reality. So that, that comes into it. Yeah. Kind of like a, a vast, social media network in some ways <laughs> in a sad way maybe but no, so far i'm enjoying it it's uh, it's quite interesting but i think i haven't quite got into the the full part of the story yet i was interested to to read on uh, indie book showcase your author insight that you mentioned your favorite character was lucy thompson yes. uh, and, and i was quite surprised by that because as i was reading sort of the early segment of blue prometheus i almost got the impression that you might have preferred, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, but Aina, is that? Aina. Aina, Aina? yeah. yeah. Cause she's I, I, love all, I love all the characters and she's okay. very dynamic. Aina is very dynamic. Um, but I love the way that Lucy develops from, she's quite timid, a little bit timid at the beginning. She's not used to um, exerting herself. She's kind of quite nice. She, she's not used to, you know, forcing things. And over the series, she toughens up and she alters. And I guess I like her because her development. I mean, the other, the other characters hopefully develop too, but yeah, I enjoy all the characters, Ina and Thomas and uh, other, other people. Do you have much religious influence? Uh, well, has religion influenced uh, a lot of any of the themes in your story? Because I noticed that the, let's say the scientific character, the, the sort of rationalist uh, Thomas, obviously the, the doubting Thomas from the Bible, is that, was that intentional or is it just sort of? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't really intentional, but after I'd chosen it, I, I saw it almost immediately. And I thought, I, I wasn't sure whether to, to continue with the name or not, but I thought, okay, just do it, go for it. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it was intentional on an unconscious level, but um, I didn't actually choose it for that reason. 
but yeah, I, I quickly became aware of it, obviously. So going back to the London riots then, did they, I mean, they inspired the beginning. Did they influence any of the rest of the story? Because obviously it's, it's sort of a conflict with an empire as well at some point. And, uh, you know, you could, you could see that perhaps in the riots from a certain perspective as well. Not really, no. It was just the beginning point. It's um, a good place to start. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've read history, I like reading history, I like reading psychology, and this has influenced me. And so you see later some parts of the empire actually reflect certain things in the, in the British Empire. What, what, one or two things, like the East India Company, for example, used to have a standing army, I think it's a few hundred thousand soldiers, it's really huge. And, um, and there's an army in, in the empire has, which is, there's a, there's a company, the empire has, I think it's a deep space trading company. And they also have their standing army when the empire uses them in the same way as the, the, the British Empire used the East India Company. So I had some, you know, I've been influenced by history, by psychology, but yeah, not just, the riots really were just a good starting point. I was also wondering if uh, the characters leaving London on the Mariner's vessel, is, is that somehow a metaphor for yourself leaving England? Well, it could have been, but I, I, it, if it was, it was an unconscious one, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's possible. <laughs> so... Uh, You've described yourself previously when we were talking in emails uh, more as as a fantasy writer, I, I think. And yeah. um, for me, though, I mean, the Blue Prometheus series, you know, you've got transdimensional spaceships and the multiverse and the solar empires and whatnot, which seems a very science fiction. <laughs> so I'm wondering, because um, I do know there is a reluctance by some authors. I've encountered with a few other authors I've been in contact with um, to consider themselves as writing science fiction if it doesn't conform perhaps to a very certain mode. Um, and, you know, one of the famous ones is Canadian author Margaret Atwood with her uh, Handmaid's Tale, who, who refused yes. to consider that science fiction. And I was just wondering, do you feel some kind of reluctance or, or unease at fully identifying as a science fiction author? Or is it just that you feel your other themes are more significant? Um, okay, that's, that's, that's a good question. I, I've been changing. I've actually been, I realized that actually I am science, science fiction and a fantasy writer. And I've come to that realization over the last probably eight or nine months. I kind of realized more and more people have said to me, mm, this feels, I can see that they say, I feel the fantasy, but it also feels like sci fi, like science fiction. And they're right. Um, it's probably a, a a bit of both of what you said. I mean, I do feel it's more, slightly more fantasy because there is magic and there are, certainly it's telepathy and a true language where they speak through the minds. Um, but there are, there's a lot of sci-fi too. Um, I love reading, like both fantasy and sci-fi. But I guess the fact that sci-fi I love more is perhaps not so much the hard sci-fi. It's, um, you, I'm interested in human stories. I'm interested in what human beings face. And I love the setting going to space. I mean, I loved Star Wars when it came out. It's like, wow, that's just incredible. You know, you see this huge ship flying over and whole, the whole setting, everything is brilliant. Um, but I, consider, I consider Star Wars actually to be science fantasy, really. It's the Emperor with magic and, you know, he's blasting the, uh, you know, Luke uh, with that. So, um, yeah, I, I, think it's, I think I'm changing. Also, some of my um, short stories have just been sci-fi, pure sci-fi recently. So I've, um, I've got, like I said, in, in answer to one of the questions on the d and Author Showcase, I, <clears throat> I have about a dozen or maybe more now short stories which are almost finished and some of those are definitely science fiction. So yeah, I, I think both. I mean, I like both. I'm probably a bit more fantasy because I do enjoy some magic inside it. I like that you call at the beginning um, science fantasy as well because I, I kind of use the same term. And it feels, it does feel like that's a, a proper genre by itself to, to denote yeah. sort of the difference between, I guess, the continuum of fantasy, science fantasy, and, uh, and sort of harder science fiction or yeah. more technological science fiction, perhaps. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a little bit on the, the middle, but the other side of you. So I like also the human driven stories. And I feel like if you get too rigid in your science fiction, the hard science fiction, you, you lose the potential for the future as well. Um, that's what I'm interested in. So, uh, because, you know, our advances, um, make, they look like magic compared to, you know, a half a century ago. So it's just, if you, if you fixate on what we know now, 
project to the future, you, you limit yourself an awful lot. And I, and I do feel that the future will feel very magical uh, compared to what we have now, and just as our present feels magical too. Yeah. I mean, oh. I, I like, was it Arthur C. Clarke made, I can't remember his quote, but it was basically what you just said. And um, any, yeah. any, ma any science that's advanced enough to it appears like magic or seems like magic. Or, but yeah. um, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Definitely. And I, I like also there's an author, um, Orson Scott Card, uh, wrote the Ender series. And um, he has an interesting f expression, which he says, the difference between fantasy and science fiction is that on the cover of a fantasy book, there's trees. And on the cover of a science fiction book, there's rivets. <laughs> so okay. In some ways, I guess that applies. <laughs> Although your covers, um, they mostly inspire nature. Um, yes. They're very nice covers. Um, Thank you. did you do them yourself or? I worked through a company, um, demonza.com. So they did that. And, um, so I didn't work personally with, with the designer. And, uh, so, so that's a publishing company or? Cover design cover. company and they do formatting and everything. But I, I just went with the, um, cover design. Yeah. Well. They're very nice covers. Yeah. Getting into the difference between science fiction and fantasy, definitely your at least the, the intro to your next series, Orange Storm, definitely feels more science fiction when, you, when you're coming straight up with uh, in, intelligent but hostile aliens. Um, what inspired that one? Um, my first series is a portal, basically a portal fantasy. You go from this world into a, a new world, um, which is one of my favorite kinds. But I also like another kind of fantasy uh, or sci-fi, which is intrusion fantasy, when something comes into into our world and um actually this this follows on from the first series um so some things at the end there's a the first series it's a battle and a fight and the good guys basically win but the bad guys they escape some of them escape and they disappear and they come to earth they find a way they found a way through to earth so i had this idea of using that so um but it's not really apparent I mean, i've given it away now but uh, um it's not it won't be really apparent if you read the first series you're probably halfway through book one before you realize ah there's a, a cross series connection so it's certainly designed to be read independently and you could read it independently no problem but there is actually some connection. So some, some things come from that universe and um, they have high, very high technology and, and black magic. And they use two together to, to manipulate people. Uh, yeah. and, and you seem to have a, a color um, thing going on with your stories. Do is that, in, that's presumably intentional, but um, is there some meaning behind that or does it just sort of feel right? Those just, colors? I, it just felt like a good idea. I mean, I guess I was always impressed by Johnny Walker. Not, not so much the whiskey, but by their branding. They had the red label and the black label. And I just thought, whoever designed that has got really, you know, he, I hope he got well paid because <laughs> I think that helps a lot, at least here in East Asia. They're so popular, even though they're not actually particularly good whiskeys, but, but they're so popular. Um, and I think the color coding and the branding. And so I, it got me thinking, should I use color codes and how would I design the covers? And, um, the blue Prometheus, it, it came slowly, really, it came quite slowly to me. I didn't know, uh, after I'd written the first novel, I didn't know that. But blue Prometheus is the name of the planet, and it's kind of blue and grey kind of colours. So I thought, okay, that's good, good enough. And um, Orange Storm, well, I imagine it starts with sandstorms coming to Earth and, uh, for various reasons. So presumably, I mean, the storm part of the second one seems pretty obvious since it sounds like a conflict coming right away. <laughs> Prometheus, is that because the two main characters were considered to be the bringers of light? Um, Prometheus, I, 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 read it, I read something a long time ago and someone suggested Prometheus uh, said that, I don't know if it's even true, it doesn't matter if it's truth or not, but somebody suggested that an alternate name for Uranus should be Prometheus. It's just somebody in some, I have no idea where that came from and I don't even know the truth of it, but it just interested me. It just made, I just interested it because I, I was developing the idea that time I was thinking about this, the first series. So I was thinking of, oh, I wanted to set it in our solar system, but in an alternate universe. And I, I wanted some of the planets to have the same name, but I also wanted some planets to have a different name just to give it a different feeling. And I, I like that idea, but, but 
probably more than that. That was one one part. The other part was yes, the story of Prometheus, the raising of the fire. In, in my story, they raised the fire, and the raising the fire is raising human consciousness, is 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 expanding consciousness, which was really what happened. That's what Prometheus did when he gave humans a fire. So so yes, it's, it's, it was both those two things. We're getting close to the. Um the spontaneous right but i want to ask you one more question before we get there and so we find a lot of inspiration as writers in the world around us of all the many issues facing humanity at the moment which one inspires you most to produce stories or inspires your stories there is so many and it's not just one it's not just one thing i mean there are there are many things there are um, environmental problems there are social issues social divisions you can see in north america in particular but it's coming over into europe um there are there will be coming change i think with ai as ai develops i think that will cause a lot of opportunities but also a lot of pain uh, when jobs change and as they will do and um and also maybe, I, no, I think almost certainly there'll be a huge loss of, of confidence. Humanity will lose confidence to some extent if we find that AI, if it does develop enough, and I think it probably will to take over most jobs, then people will start to question, you know, what is what is the meaning of life? What, what are we here for? If, if machines can do some everything better than we can do, what should we do? What's our meaning? And I, I think this could have quite a, um, a big effect. Uh, something like, like uh, Darwin's Origin of Species had in the 19th century when people kind of um, lost confidence in this, you know, they, they, God was displaced and God is dead and each and all this, all this stuff. So th this went to where people had to find a new way of, of looking at the world. And I, I think something similar and quite big will happen with AI when it takes jobs and that will cause pain. Of course, opportunity too. I mean, there'll be great opportunity, uh, but um, certainly pain and a changing view of what, what's the meaning of, yeah, what's our meaning? What's the meaning of being a human? So I guess all of these things do interest me. Um, so many, so many things interest me. Um, yeah, I can't say that there's one in particular at the moment that I'm working through several. I'm working with different short stories. I'm working through different, different issues. So would you say that you explore them in your short stories and then the ones that for the themes that perhaps inspire you more, you'll, you'll maybe consider building into a larger story. Is that sort of how you work or? Not, not really. No, but, but because the, um, the thing is with the novels, they take a long time and the series take a long time. So I can have many new ideas, things happen in the world and, but they're already happening and maybe they won't come into my stories until much later. Because you know you get you get in a in a in a groove, but it's kind of in a group. You, you, I'm going in a direction. I'm going in a certain direction with the stories, and because I'm writing two or three or maybe four novels in this new series, it takes time. Short stories very fast. I can write a short story in a couple of days, really, at a, at a first draft at least, and then polish it up. And so I can explore different issues and different. Diff quite different things um, in my short stories. Um, for example, one one short story I wrote recently um, is science fiction, and it was f for my critique group. We sometimes run flash fiction challenges, so about every month or a couple of months, we'll have we'll give some prompts, and then everyone has three days to write a story. So one of the prompts I, I chose, but I didn't know the story I was going to write when I chose, was like um, a space pod, a spaceship, a little space pod facing. A warrior. Uh, it's not clear if a warrior was modern or old, but you can see it's like a warrior in a, in a tropical forest on a distant planet. Okay, so I thought I was trying to think what to write. Before that, I'd listened to a lecture, online lecture, about um, it was actually about the Bible, the psychological significance of the Bible. Okay, even though I'm not Christian, really, I don't follow this, but I was very interested. And the, the talker, he, he picked one part of the one phrase from the Bible. He said, you know, blessed are the, the meek, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, so he picked that. And he, he said, this is quite strange, it doesn't fit psychologically. And I, I agreed with him. I always thought that's quite an odd thing. Why should meek people inherit the earth? And he talked about the etymology, that meek used to mean not proud. And then he, he talked about... Um, um, how it came from Hebrew apparently and it meant something like someone who has power and strength but has the restraint not to use it will inherit the world so I thought this was quite an interesting idea so my idea came from from partly from this 
I guess partly from the Bible, from a different interpretation of Bible, even though I'm not, you know, I'm not actually not Christian. Um, but I was interested in that idea. And so I, I put it and used it in this story with like an AI unit, an AI, a very advanced AI unit that had been superseded in some ways by other AI and a warrior who had also been superseded. And so I, I call the story Warriors with Sheathed Swords. And so they're both warriors, but they have the, the power and restraint not to attack each other. And they inherit, basically they, they gain something from this world. So, you know, I take ideas from all over the place, really. So they can come from quite different directions. Um, yeah. I, don't, I, I think, think I went, I didn't, maybe didn't answer your question at all, but yeah. That's fine. And uh, now I find it interesting too, because that, that phrase, the, the meek shall inherit the earth, um, I've kind of been interpreting it my own way recently. Um, given that we're starting to colonize off the planet, it's almost like the, the meek are the ones who will be left behind when everyone else leaves. <laughs> um, but, but so again, in that, in that vein of uh, starting to colonize, and now China has big plans to go to uh, Mars, so there's going to be a Yes. Elon Musk versus China on Mars, maybe. I don't know, but <laughs> it almost starts to seem like the beginning of your empire in uh, Blue Prometheus. Well, yeah, I, I hope it goes a different direction, but I know what human nature is like. So, yeah, I think there could be power struggles, certainly in uh, for resources and control. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, our time's getting on. So why don't we move to the, uh, the, the written part? So uh, I call this segment Revenge of the Muse. And uh, so prior to the interview, I sent you four randomly rolled story cubes that represented the categories of hero, action, setting, and science fiction element, and asked you to prepare a, a paragraph or a short introduction to a story using those cubes as guides. Uh, and just so for those following along at home who would like to try their hand at this, the images for, for each author throughout the series will be posted on uh, Alternate Futures website in the podcast section. And uh, before you read your section, maybe you can describe the, the images I sent you and sort of how you interpreted them. And then we can, uh, we can hear your piece and discuss a bit more about it. Okay, you sent me a hero, which I couldn't quite make out, but he's a guy with a mask sitting on the ground. It looked like he's facing a sun. So I just imagined him, um, he's, he's pushing away problems and the sun is there and he's covered in a mask so maybe it's a hot place with the setting feature was the cactus so I said in um, a desert world and the action well I think I'm, I probably went astray on this one but part of the action is that some people are building um, a colony really on this planet which is already inhabited and so there's a building of a fortress and the sci-fi elements yeah well you'll see <laughs> okay well yeah, so this is, I, I actually I actually wrote a few hundred words. It's about two minutes. Um, it's more than I thought, but uh, that's why I did. Okay. Sam Ryder cursed the cowards that had been his colleagues. Everything they'd said was a lie. He stood in the blistering sun, accused of a murder he hadn't committed. The sentence was death under the desert sun or from the poison needles of the sword-like cacti behind him. The spaceship hovered a few hundred feet above the desert planet, waiting for him to die. Nearby, a small group of alien humanoids watched too, a shaman, a spearman, and a young woman. The message had been clear. They'd kill him if he attempted to speak. The shaman pointed to the cops of strange cacti. Death under the burning sun was hard. The second choice was at least fast. He pushed into the cops. The first puncture was from a single spine he hadn't seen. Sam pulled out the red needle. He felt his body burn. The shaman moved to the edge of the copse, green. Sam had learned a few words of the language, including the colors. He reached for a green needle, it pricked his finger. This one cooled him. Psychedelics, Sam tried to laugh, but then his legs gave way. As he crashed to the ground, the spaceship's engines came to life. They'd returned to their fortress. He cursed them again as they left him to die. As Sam waited for the poisons to work, he heard the shaman speak, ascend. Sam's mind cleared. He seemed to be levitating. Then he saw his body lying on the ground. He'd read reports of near-death experiences, of people almost dying. He'd never believed them, but now he hoped. A stairway appeared before him. At the top was a red and green door. You're not dead. The shaman stood beside him and pointed to the doorway. She will judge you. She, the daughter of the Lord of Truth. Sam Ryder climbed the steps, more curious than ever. Okay, that's the story. I see the beginning of a, a fragment. 
Well, that's pretty good. Did you have much trouble interpreting the, the images? Quite a lot of trouble, yeah. I just made up. I, I, I just took them and I was very um, creative with, with what I saw. <laughs> no, that's great. Because what, I looked at your images and uh, I also with the hero was a bit, I was, it took me a long time. And then I think what they were actually going for was something like Harry Potter, to be honest. I wondered if it was like a broomstick, but then I thought, no, it can't be that. He's got to be like on a side for Rich or something like that. Yeah, Yeah, because then I, initially I was like, that looks like a sun or something as well. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, I really like what you did with that. Um, would you, you see this as a beginning of a short story, you think, or a, or a novel? Um, I had no idea, really. I mean, I, I could think I could extend it if I wanted to. I mean, I didn't plan out, you know, any long story like that. Yeah, yeah. It does definitely have a similar feel, I think, to the uh, the worlds of Prometheus in in a very vague way. I mean, the nature and the magic. Obviously, Prometheus isn't a desert planet, but <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah, I can definitely see the the influence of your writing there. What was your overall experience uh, in the writing of this? Was it fairly easy once you sort of decided on the cubes? I th I thought about it for about half an hour over a glass of wine one night. I just I thought about it and um, just jotted some notes down. And then I just put the notes away. Three or four days later, I wrote the first draft. It took me about 20 minutes, really. I just wrote that down quickly. Then I put it away again. And then today I, I edited it for about 15 minutes, really. So just, um, yeah, I, I tried to go fast on that. So, I mean, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I liked this idea. Um, inside my, my new, my upcoming novel, Orange Storm, um, the heroes take refuge in a house in London and the house is like anarchist, social anarchist kind of house and they have these quotes on the walls, scrawled on the walls. I mean, Nietzsche was um, something like, uh, I can't remember exactly, but the government, something like the government, everything the government says is a lie and everything that they have has been stolen. Okay, that, that was just part of these um, side characters, um, minor characters inside the story. So I had that inside my mind and I thought, Part of that quote came to me when his reaction to being betrayed by this, you know, everything they say is a lie, everything they say is, is false, that kind of thing. Yeah, that mm. came to me. Excellent. No, I, was, I really liked how you put all the elements together. I was kind of curious how some of them were going to come together yeah. with uh, the sort of uh, the high tech device and then the and then the desert and whatnot, or whether you'd go with a cactus potted plant or something. <laughs> But uh, for anyone who wants to try their, their own hand at this particular set of cubes, they're, again, they're on the alternatefutures.co.uk website. Um, so I think we're pretty much at the end of our time. Um, so thanks very much, Ned, for, for joining me today. And uh, okay, is, there any, is there anything, any books that are coming out very soon? Uh, or if you would like to let people know where they can find you online? Well, I have a new book coming out but I'm not exactly sure, probably August, probably August um, 2021, for people who see in the future, um, called Orange Storm. Um, online, you can find me on nedmarcus.com. It's the easiest place. Okay, I'm, well, I'm, also, I'm also on Facebook, yeah. Thanks very much for joining me today. Yeah, speak to you again. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Transcripts of this and all episodes are available at alternatefutures.co.uk as are the StoryCube images and original story openings written by my guests. If you've enjoyed this, why not share it with friends and other sci-fi fans you know? If there are any indie sci-fi creators you'd like to see featured, send me a message at podcast at alternatefutures.co.uk. Finally, if you'd like to support this podcast financially, you can do so on Subscribestar. Just search for Alternate Futures. There you can find extra discussions and information that hasn't made it into the final edit. And thank you once again for listening. I hope you'll join us on the next episode. This is the future. Human error. Evolution. This is the future.